world with an, an, an angst that just is determined to know God in His Word. So have a friend and read my name. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. My question is if the Bible is sufficient for soul care and is kind of what the church has had to work with for the majority of its existence, what is the purpose of studying secular psychology? No trouble, Michael. <laughs> Explain. I just thought we were um, I'm very grateful for my PhD in clinical psychology. For two reasons. The less important of the two is it gives me a platform for what I want to do. And I think that's very legitimate. And I think you're, you're, we live in a world that has accreditation issues and licensure issues and professional issues. And in order to do what maybe perhaps God has called you to, if you need a degree in psychology counseling for that purpose, that's a very legitimate thing. But, but, but far more importantly, looking back at my five years in graduate school, I believe that the central value to me was not authority, but catalytic. I found my, my studies very provocative. They, they forced me to ask questions that I'm not sure if I had the maturity or the wisdom to know how to ask with my Bible open in front of me. I think that so often raising a strong Christian home, which I'm very, very grateful. I think I read the Bible pretty much as making sure I was doctrinally correct and knew who was in with accuracy and who was out with inaccuracy. I think that was the way I was thinking about the Bible up until graduate school. But in graduate school, we can ask, got, got, me ask, got me asking questions that I think were latent within me. Like, why do I stutter? I was a nice stutterer as a kid. And I just couldn't figure it out. Why could I just not say my first name? My name is Larry. And I had people come up to me when I was in high school. Hi, what's your name? And I go, Jim. I didn't say that. I was like the president of junior high school in front of the 800 students. I had to be after the principal. I had Larry Crabb at Plymouth Whitehurst High School, and I started my whole way through. I was so embarrassed. I couldn't figure out what's going on with me. My church had no answers. The Bible had no answers. So I admired in speech pathology in graduate school to get some answers. I really didn't find any. But I think I, but I didn't find any, but it got me asking questions in the right direction. And then my mind was triggered to ask in categories. My mind was triggered to ask in, uh, in certain ways of thinking that they made me look at the Bible very differently. And so I really do think that, that your psychological training, you must not look at it as authoritative in the same way you look at the Bible as authoritative, but look at all your secular theories when you're studying, you know, all the classics of Boyd, Dr. Skinner, and all the modern stuff, systems theory, and all the rest of it. And as you start studying all that, it's, it's good to study because it's provocative and catalytic more than authoritative. That's my answer as to why I ever study psychology. Um, one more question. Um, how, how would you say, okay, so I'm studying and looking at how it works within a Christian framework. What do you think existential psychology brings to a Christian way of helping people? How does existential psychology, yeah, how can it be helpful to you as a Christian counselor? Yes. You read Urban Yala much? Um, well, why, why are you Irving Yall is my favorite secular psychiatrist. And he's, he's an existentialist. I, read, I think everything he's written. I had tremendous value in Dr. Yall. I heard him speak once. I got him to sign one of his books for me. Um, I believe that if I were not a Christian, I'd be an existentialist. Because I believe the existentialist is recognizing that empiricism does not reach absolute truth. And it enters the mystery of existence. I think that most of us as Christians fall into the trap of hating mystery and therefore reducing the Bible to formula. That's a hideous mistake. And I think that you must read the Bible to, to, to enter the mystery of a God that you cannot understand, but you can enjoy. And uh, the existentialist, I believe, is asking the, the fundamental questions of human existence. What is the meaning of death? What is the meaning of suffering? What is the meaning of freedom? Uh, the album talks about four central issues of existentialism, freedom, death, and two others. Isolation. Isolation, yeah. And something else. Yes. 
Yeah. 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 And I think, I think the value of existential psychology, studying and reading the existentialist, and in fact is Jean-Paul Sartre. And reading some of the, the classical philosophers of existentialism, not just the, the existential psychologists, but the existential philosophers. And I think they, 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 they get you to grapple with issues of the soul that will either drive you to meaninglessness and suicide or trust in Christ, one or two. And I think that's where you're going to be. Um, Yalom says in one of his books, he says, um, let me tell you what the existentialist dilemma is. Um, he says, the, exist the existentialist dilemma is the realization that we are all born, we come into this world with a desperate longing for meaning, but we come into a world where there is none. Because if you're an existentialist, then there's no final meta-narrative, no final story, no final truth, nothing, nothing absolute. So you come into the world where there is no meaning, it's all skyhooks. And then the existentialist job, given his dilemma of longing for a meaning that does not exist, is to create his own meaning, and then to spend the rest of his life trying to forget that he was its creator. Isn't that pathetic? I wrote the Dr. Yama and um, shared some thinking about that. I never got a response. <laughs> um, but he was asked at the meeting that I was at when he spoke, there were 300 of us, mostly secular folks, a couple of Christians were there. And one person asked the question, Dr. Yellow, you know, I think Dr. Yellow now is not pushing media, I'm not sure he's up to the years. He was 73 or four when I heard him five, six, seven years ago. And somebody said to him, Dr. Yellow, you talk about fear, and uh, as death rather, as one of the major existential crises, and you're going to be an old man, you're going to be facing that crisis. Tell me how you're thinking about it now that you're old. Bit of a bold question. And the audience answer, this is not verbatim, but it's almost exactly verbatim. He said, when I realized, when I came to the conclusion that there is no hell, there is no fear of death within me anymore. The man is blind. We need to pray for the man. And he said, now I live for generativity, by which he meant I want to pass on whatever I know to other generations before I die in oblivion and there's nothing. So what's there to fear? Albert Ellis taught this in his rational motive therapy of 20, 30 years ago. The fear of death is handled by telling yourself the truth that there's no afterlife. What do you pray with? Live for now. It's very simple. Presentation really gets you to wrestle with the fundamental issues that too often the church we don't wrestle with. That's my response. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, Harvey. How am I? Well, let me think. <laughs> Um, thank you for coming. Um, I have a question as far as empathy. Um, I really loved your book, Connecting, and just really sharing about how people are just, just really deeply connect with people through the power of Christ. And I've always been told that I have the gift of mercy, and I love people, and I want to know people like to the depths of their souls and to truly go deep with them. But I find a lot of people resist that. This is like a wall. And I ask for to help me to go deeper with them, but it's just that wall. So how do you go past the wall? And then my, the next question is, is it possible to empathize too much for somebody? Because if we're supposed to carry one another's burdens, then where is the line drawn? Apparently, it's kind of like hiding behind your profession you were talking about earlier. Do you have to hide behind your profession to where you don't carry too much of their burden? Or is that such a thing? The problem with all the great questions that are being asked is uh, in a couple of minutes I can't do justice to the goodness of the question. So all I can do is get a couple of thoughts that um, won't be able to satisfy it, I'm not satisfied with my answers. Um, you asked about empathy, let me just make a few comments. Um, Oswald Chambers makes a comment that oftentimes our empathy gets in the way of the work of God. And what he means by that is that when God is taking us through tough times, if we empathize for the purpose of providing relief, we're oftentimes quenching what the Spirit wants to do through the difficult time. 
And so empathy must not be offered as a, as a basis of, of as a, for the fundamental goal of belief, as I see it. Um, I think empathy is overrated um, because the deepest part of my soul, you can never really touch it. You never really know where I am. And so the worst you can ever say to me is, I understand, because you don't. Um, but having said that, if we're going to actually connect, about connecting, if we're going to actually, if my soul is going to meet your soul, then rather than thinking of empathy as the essence of connection, I think the essence of connection has much more to do with me as I talk with you, with your defenses up, with your walls up, um, wanting to connect with you, caring about you, loving you, and you're defensive and full of all the pain and wounds of your soul that you're guarding against relationship with. Um, if, 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 if perfect love casts out fear, then I'm up a creek because I don't I never love anybody perfect love. But I can, as I interact with you, my understanding of empathy goes something like this. I, I can make it a very strong commitment within my soul to become very still in your presence and not try to accomplish anything with you because I don't have any power apart from the Spirit of God. So if I just relax and stop churning, then maybe rather than using empathy skills, then maybe I can discover the very deepest center of my soul. Because do you understand this? I mean, is this just religious nice talk or is this true? Do you really believe that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that is the spirit of the relationship between the Father and Son, which is a perfect relationship, that that spirit of that kind of relating is in the center of my being. I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, Lewis talked about um, that you see an old couple been married for, you know, 60 years and the relationship is so strong and they're so one, there's such a knitting between their souls that there's a spirit about their relationship. He said, we all can relate to that if you've seen an old couple that just are so united in their marriage. He said, now take that and multiply it by infinity and now you have the father and son and the spirit of their relationship because their relationship is so infinite and profound, the spirit of their relationship is himself a person. And that person is within me, and if I can discover the center of my soul when the Holy Spirit is alive, then I can speak out of that by discerning what is most alive within me as I talk with you, and I speak out of what is most alive based on the Spirit's work within me, then I believe there's going to be something in the core of your being that's going to begin to relax a little bit. Because the reason you have your walls up is because you're terrified. There's a terror within your soul. Put your walls down, you're going to be destroyed. Put your walls down and what's going to happen to you when you were a six-year-old little boy, six-year-old little girl, when you were abused, when you were whatever, and your father rejected you, whatever happened to you when you were little, we all have our stories, that you learn to put up your walls. I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to whoever. That you learn to put up your walls. Maybe you do, of course, too, for sure. That you learn to put up your walls. I learned to put up my walls. And, and the, the, the walls that are put up are partly a, damn you. Where were you when this happened to me? Oswald Chambers says, the root of all sin is the suspicion that God isn't good. And given what's happened, how can God be good and allow that? And so, how can I trust you? I'll take over. Which comes kind of naturally, because that's my natural nature as a sinner. And so then I put up my walls based on the terror. And then when somebody comes along and speaks of the deepest part of her soul, where there absolutely is no judgment, but there's nothing but love and compassion, and a desire to see you become fully alive as a woman, fully alive as a man, fully alive to the glory of God, when that becomes a reality in me, then that's going to touch your terror in a way that you want to relax a little bit. And then maybe we're going to connect. So that's why I do that again. I have a good question. Um, in the place where you're in, like, do you have any mentors that um, still teach you or show you um, new things? And how do you find respect for those who still do just uh, tell something that's meaningful to you in your life? Yeah, how do you mentor and how do you find them if you don't have them? Um, for you specifically, the place where you're going to For you specifically. I would count as one of the most significant blessings in my life a couple of older folks that mentor me from a distance. James Houston being one of them, the fellow that called me in the hospital 